Thank you very much for the um, invitation, the introduction, and your presence. Um, so on the basis of the uh, IPCC fifth assessment report, AR5 in our dragon, I'd like to uh, give you a, key, uh, a, few key, a few key messages from that report uh, to the extent, I hope, they are relevant to the uh, discussion of the day. Uh, I'll, I'll end with a few remarks uh, on, on the some of the implications from the report for the uh, climate deal in, in preparation for next year in, in Paris. Just a quick reminder of uh, why the IPCC reports, uh, which come upstream from the reports just shown, are so uh, important. Uh, the strength of IPCC, IPCC being the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, come from several factors, including the fact that it's a very international effort. I mean, the last report was written uh, by more than 800 lead authors, plus a few hundreds of contributing authors, reviewed by thousands of uh, experts, governments, uh, uh, international, uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, more than 140,000 comments which have been taken on board one by one in the um, review cycle. So it's a very, uh, it's a result of a massive effort to assess the state of knowledge on, on the literature and to uh, reflect it in, in the best manner in a policy relevant way uh, without being policy prescriptive. So the IPCC uh, by mandate cannot say you must do this, you must do that. It can sometimes say if you want to do that then the laws of physics tell you, or the laws of chemistry or for climate science then tell you that you have such constraints, but it cannot uh, uh, provide recommendations out of the blue. Uh, its report are uh, very uh, widely used, and the, uh, the fact that governments are involved, uh, since the I in IPCC stands for intergovernmental, is very important for the buy-in. Uh, of governments, uh, uh, of uh, the, basically the 190 and also countries in the UN uh, in the um, uh, reports, because since the government have been associated closely uh, at different stages uh, of the preparation of the report, uh, they cannot walk away uh, at the end, and uh, they cannot just simply put the, uh, the report in, 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 a, in a drawer uh, after it has been uh, published. The uh, assessment report number five, the fifth assessment report, is uh, probably the best ever. Uh, the first report was published in 1990, and the last one was finalized two weeks ago in Copenhagen. Uh, it reflects a much better integration of uh, questions related to the mitigation of climate change and the questions related to the adaptation um, to climate change. There is an improved risk management approach. Uh, there are new uh, scenarios. We moved away from the old uh, S-REST scenarios. We didn't contain any uh, mitigation. Um, there is a special effort uh, to provide regional information when available. Uh, sustainable development and equity aspects are better handled in this report than in previous reports. Uh, there's a co more comprehensive treatment of uh, several economic aspects and of several cross-cutting issues. Uh, some emerging issues, including important issues such as acidification, for example, receive much more attention than in, in previous reports. And uh, last but not least, uh, there's a better handling and communication of uncertainties uh, uh, around the, um, the, the conclusion and the statement of the report. The three key questions that the report are trying to solve, to answer, are the following. And the IPCC has three working groups, and the working groups don't match exactly the three questions, but they all uh, three contribute to a certain extent to answering those three questions. The first working group deals with the uh, physical science aspect of the question, the climate science aspect of the question. The second deals with the consequences, uh, the impacts, the uh, adaptation and vulnerability questions. And the third working group deals with mitigation, how to reduce emissions uh, that are warming the climate. But the three questions the uh, IPCC tries to answer is ba are basically the following. What is happening? What are the risks? What can be done? I may run 
short of time, uh, in which case I'll give you the key messages uh, of, of the overall report right now, and I'll provide, of, of course, uh, some details um, in, in the time remaining. But if I have to stop before I am at the end of my reservoir of slides, you have seen the key messages. The first one is that human influence on the climate system is clear. The second is that the more we disrupt our climate with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the more we risk severe pervasive and irreversible impacts uh, in many sectors. While climate change, the third conclusion is, while climate change is uh, a threat to sustainable development, there are also uh, many opportunities to integrate mitigation, adaptation, and the pursuit of other societal objectives than only, quote unquote, uh, protecting climate or adapting to climate change. And the final message is uh, an optimistic one, and it's based on the work of both the Working Group 2 and 3 of the IPCC, and that is that we have the means to limit climate change and to uh, build, uh, at the same time, a more prosperous and sustainable future. Climate change, does it exist? Well, if you look at this um, curve, you might wonder, and there are people who are asking questions about the temperature of the last 15 years, and uh, they forget that actually you could have asked those questions many times during the last 100 years. Uh, and if you select you know, a 10 or 12 or 15 year period uh, by taking a high point and a low point, then you can easily try to manipulate the data and uh, show, try to show that there is no warming, while if you really take the entire period, the entire trend, it's very clear, of course, there's some viability from, from year to year. It's very clear that climate is indeed warming, has increased by approximately one degree over the last, in global average, uh, over the last hundred years. So that is uh, no, not for discussion anymore. Why is this happening? It's now very well understood that it's mostly because of the very strong increase, it's a more than 40% 40, 40 increase in the concentration of a gas uh, which had been stable in its concentration for the last 10,000 years, CO2. And if we uh, look at the uh, concentration, uh, the percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere, and everybody knows now that CO2 is a, a, a heat-trapping gas uh, contributing to the warming of the climate. If you look at the concentration of that gas for the last 800,000 years, which, which I've shown here, you see that never during that long period uh, the concentration has been higher than about 300 ppm. So we're now at 400 and we are on our way if emissions are not curbed very significantly uh, to much higher value still. So this is the main cause of the warming. Why is the uh, CO2 concentration increasing? Well, I'm not going to give you a, a course on the uh, carbon cycle um, today, but uh, basically it's because of the uh, human emissions of CO2 which are disturbing the uh, carefully balanced uh, CO natural CO2 cycle that existed before uh, we started to burn coal, oil and gas and also uh, contributing about 15% of the global emissions uh, deforestation and changes in land use. You see the, the strong increase over the last 50 years uh, of the uh, emissions of uh, CO2, uh, mostly coming from developed countries uh, until relatively recently, and only recently uh, coming mostly from emerging countries. But the bulk of the increase uh, and the uh, explanation for the increased concentration in the atmosphere come from uh, the burning of fossil fuel in developed countries. In terms of sector, uh, it mostly comes, I mean, the largest sector in terms of origin of the greenhouse gases, and CO2 is the main of those, uh, is uh, the energy sector, accounting for about 35%, uh, agriculture, forest, and other land use, about 20, 24%, industry, 21%, transport, 14%, building sector, 6 
These were the numbers in 2010, at least. Climate is indeed changing. It's very hard to see the averages. What is much more visible and becoming more and more visible is the uh, frequency or intensity of some extreme events. And the uh, two categories where it's the clearest are the number of extreme hot days and uh, uh, very uh, warm periods. Uh, and also the heavy precipitation event. And when I mean precipitation, it's not only rain, it's also snow. So it might surprise you, but it's not, not at all uh, incompatible to have two meters of snow in New York, uh, which is about what they have uh, now or will have in the next few days, uh, and to have a warming climate. Because when you have a warming climate, you have more water vapor in the atmosphere. And so the quantity of water or snow, if it's cold enough still to have snow, can be larger in a, in a short period of time. So the impacts are already underway everywhere on the planet, from tropics to the poles, uh, in many areas, uh, on all continents, but also in the ocean. The ocean is also affected by something else than, strictly speaking, climate change. It's also affected by ocean acidification, which is due to the uh, absorption of uh, about one quarter of our human emissions of CO2 by the oceans, which acidifies the water and makes life for marine orga organisms more difficult. It's affecting rich and poor countries, but the poor are always more vulnerable everywhere, both in rich and, and poor countries. So this is what has happened uh, up to now. So we need to look at what the future uh, uh, has uh, in, in, in reserve for us. Now, of course, for the future, we have to work with uh, scenarios. Uh, because nobody can predict uh, what the future emissions of CO2 will be. They will be the result of uh, decisions that will be taken over the coming decades. So here are the, main, the, the four main scenarios considered by the IPCC for its last report. The top one is a business as usual scenario and bring us to con concentration of CO2 uh, that could reach 2000 ppm. Uh, five times the present concentration, so really extremely high concentrations of CO2. And the three lower scenarios you see here are stabilization scenario at different levels of the uh, concentration of CO2. The lowest one, stabilizing the concentration at the end of the 23rd century, uh, approximately at 400 ppm. And that's the only scenario which, with some reasonable probability, uh, allows temp the global temperature to be stabilized to less than two degree, a two degree warming above the pre-industrial temperature. You have uh, the, um, the the result of those uh, uh, of the of the um, uh, of what happens when you um, uh, provide those scenarios to climate models. These are the results in terms of temperature. You see the lowest scenario gets you to a plus one degree, plus or minus uh, a few tenths of a degree by the end of the century, while the top scenario um, reaches uh, plus four degrees, plus or minus uh, one degree by the end of the century. It's, it's a large, these are large numbers, particularly the top one. Uh, you should know that over the last 10,000 years, the temperature has been stable, plus or minus one degree. Uh, and the last time there was an increase in temperature, in global temperature, by more than four or five degrees, uh, of the order of four or five degrees, it was when the Earth left the last ice age. And it was a huge change in the habitability of the planets. And that change took 3,000 years to take place, not 100 years. So the business as usual scenario is really a scenario where big changes uh, in the habitability of the planet uh, would uh, take place. The potential impacts on climate change are uh, to be expected in many areas, but some of the key impacts are in the food and water area, in the um, poverty, uh, the difficulty to eradicate poverty, I mean the additional obstacles to eradicate poverty, uh, in increased uh, displacement of people, uh, in coastal flooding because of the sea level rise that accompanies the, accompanies the, uh, the warming. Um, some adaptation uh, to those uh, changes that have been, um, uh, that have taken place is already occurring. It's the beginning. 
Uh, but adaptation has its limits. I, I like to illustrate that by this, by zooming on those uh, three sectors here, water, food security, and diseases in Africa. Just take one uh, region. What is shown here is uh, for, uh, the, um, for look, look at the last two, uh, the, the two bottom, uh, bottom uh, horizontal bars there. Uh, you have a bar related to uh, a long-term uh, two-degree warming, and the bottom bar is related to a four-degree warming. Uh, and the solid bar is, uh, the shows the increase in risk uh, for those two situations uh, with a uh, high level of adaptation. Uh, and the um, hatchet um, uh, bar, if you go to the end of the bar, it shows what, uh, what happens in terms of increased risk in those key sectors, water, food security, diseases, uh, without uh, adaptation or at least with the, uh, uh, with the um, current uh, level of adaptation. As you can see, there is some potential, uh, particularly if uh, temperature is limited to a uh, two degree warming, to reduce the increase in risk in those sectors with adaptation, but not to reduce it to zero. And also what is very clear from those uh, diagrams is that the potential uh, for adaptation is significantly larger for a two degree warming world than for a four degree warming world. In other words, adaptation is important and, and can protect and reduce some of the severity of the impacts, but cannot uh, be expected to solve all the problems if uh, mitigation at a large level uh, doesn't take place to prevent the warming to go beyond that warming of two degrees or even a potentially a lower value. I mean, there are many countries who would like to see that two degree target replaced by a 1.5 degree target. Uh, we should be aware of that. Uh, we're not going to look at the details of this, but I just wanted to, to show you that this exercise of seeing what the potential is for adaptation in, uh, for different scenarios has been made for all regions of the world. And as you can quickly see, overall, the picture is the same, whether you speak about North America or Africa or, or, or Asia, everywhere adaptation has some potential, but there are limits uh, as well, because the risk of climate change uh, in agriculture, in water resources, in the health area, etc., etc., is of course increasing uh, if uh, the emissions uh, and, and therefore the temperature continue to uh, increase. Uh, the uh, uh, entire volume uh, two of the IPCC is summarized in this diagram showing for five categories of uh, risks, uh, five, five reasons for concern, uh, the uh, increased, um, the, the level of additional risk due to climate change for the different uh, increase in temperature. And as you can see, uh, when you uh, uh, go beyond 1.5, 2 degrees, you enter in the red zone, uh, at least of a red zone being high additional risk before the purple zone, which is very high additional risk. When you go beyond uh, approximately 1.5, 2 degrees above pre-industrial, at least for the first two categories, and you get there in any case a little later for the other categories as well. So it's very clear that the, um, the, the lowest uh, emission scenarios uh, shown uh, again here as a reminder uh, are, are more likely uh, to keep the level of risk in, in the lower values than uh, the uh, business as usual scenario, which is uh, the top uh, extreme. Another way to, um, to, to look at the issue is to um, consider this diagram showing the relationship, which is almost linear, between the um, total emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, approximately, and the increase in, of temperature. And also to extend that diagram using climate simulations for the future. And as you can see, when you uh, increase the total amount of uh, CO2 uh, emitted by human activities, uh, it, it, um, it maps almost linearly uh, on an increase uh, in temperature. In other words, if you want to limit, and, and that's what uh, government leaders have decided in Copenhagen in 2009, confirmed in Cancun in 2010, if you want 
to limit the warming to two degrees because uh, a political assessment has been made that beyond two degrees it's becoming too dangerous, then it means a limited amount of total cumulated emissions. And of course, this has severe consequences for uh, the, um, the dynamics of the uh, climate negotiations and for mitigation policies. Another way to look at it, uh, to look at the same thing, is to see, uh, to look at the shape of the emission patterns uh, associated to the four emission scenarios which I showed you earlier. And as you can see, the bottom scenario, the, uh, the one leading uh, to uh, uh, keeping the temperature below two degrees approximately is an emission scenario which crosses the zero line well before the end of the century, which means uh, global emissions that would get to zero well before the end of the century, when today we emit approximately 50,000 uh, of the order of 50,000 tons of uh, uh, 50, excuse me, 50 billion tons of uh, uh, tons of uh, greenhouse gases, and uh, if uh, uh, we want to uh, get to zero while allowing for uh, an increased energy access to those who don't have any uh, energy services today in many uh, in many countries, and uh, if we allow to, to if we need to if we want to allow sustainable development to uh, to occur. Uh, in that context, uh, of course, it's a big, it's a big challenge. And the window uh, for action is, is rapidly closing because since it's the cumulated emissions, since the beginning of the emissions which influence the global temperature, well, uh, it means that uh, uh, with time, the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, emissions that can take place is, is really um, uh, uh, becoming narrow, narrow and narrower. Now, the good news, as indicated in the beginning, is that there are many options to uh, reduce emissions, options which I discussed in 2000 page in the uh, third uh, volume of the IPCC report. Uh, for example, uh, in a more efficient use of energy, in a greater use of low carbon and no carbon energy, in improving carbon sinks, in changes in lifestyle, in behavioral, uh, uh, behavioral changes. Uh, just to give a few examples, um, the um, uh, IPCC concluded that uh, ambitious mitigation is actually possible uh, and affordable, that even using relatively classic ways of looking at the uh, cost of mitigation, uh, a, a worldwide effort to limit the temperature to uh, less than 2 degrees would only reduce economic growth by 0.06% when the business as usual uh, growth in any case would be on the average during the next 100 years be around 1.6 to 3 percent per year. So it would translate into a delayed and not a foregone uh, growth. But the estimated costs do not take into account the benefits of limiting climate change. Um, uh, and we should also know, of course, that unmitigated climate change, on the other hand, would create increasing risks to economic growth. So we have the choices. We have the choices uh, we have the choice to um, between going towards uh, the, 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 the left um, uh, temperature increase by the end of the century, where the temperature would be higher than today, but manageable, I mean, adaptation would still be possible, or the right uh, kind of word, with increases in temperature uh, reaching uh, in uh, polar regions and in, on continents up to 9, 10, 11 degrees, which is a huge uh, change uh, in the, uh, the context in which uh, human activities take place. We have the choices. A, s a few of the uh, implications of all this for a climate deal in Paris, since uh, that's uh, one of the subjects of the day. Well, I hope I have uh, shown you that there is a need for a uh, very ambitious um, program for mitigation, for emission reduction, that would contribute to the goal of uh, global zero net uh, emissions of greenhouse gases well before the end of the century. Uh, if uh, we want to, uh, if humanity wants to, to uh, limit uh, the warming to less than two degrees C, 
Uh, it shows also that because there is some inertia, because some warming has taken place, because of the, 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 the weight, uh, the role of past emissions, uh, and because the uh, climate system has such a large inertia, uh, even if emissions were stopped now, there would still be climate, uh, some climate warming for some time. Uh, so there is a need for adaptation as well. Uh, as there is a strong need for mitigation. Uh, a, a strong conclusion from the IPCC report is whether looking at adaptation or mitigation is that international cooperation increases the effectiveness of uh, any measures that are taken, that it's much better to take measures together than to allow individual agent, country, sectors, stakeholders, whatever, to, to act uh, alone. Uh, and also uh, that cooperation, such cooperation reduces the costs overall of, of, the, uh, of the actions that are taken. And the last point I'd like to make, and it's, it's, it's not the, ex the exact quotation, I've not had the time to check the exact wording, but it's basically what's written there in the last IPCC report, as it was written uh, in the previous uh, IPCC report, and as it was written many years ago in many articles already, I'm looking at Nadine, uh, an agreement perceived as fair uh, as a much higher probability to be accepted. Of course, this has many consequences for uh, the way uh, questions such as financing, etc., technology transfer, etc., uh, uh, taken into account uh, in the agreement that will emerge from Lima and, most important, Paris next year. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>